So welcome everyone to this next uh, talk of uh, the One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Fuster from the University of York. Um, he's going to talk about measurement of quantum fields in curved space times. Uh, before I hand over to Chris, uh, just to remind you that this talk is uh, recorded and you can watch the recording uh, online on YouTube on our channel. Uh, so please, Chris, uh, take it from here. Thank you. Well, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about uh, quantum field theory in curved space time and particularly what can be said about the measurement of uh, quantum fields. And this is based on work with Rainer Fersch and uh, my colleague Henning Bostelman, our student Maximilian Rupp, and uh, further work in progress also with Ian Jump. So let's uh, start by going back to basics in quantum mechanics. If you think all the way back to your first course in quantum mechanics, you will have learned doubtless some typical things, namely uh, number one, that all Hermitian operators are observables. Number two, that when a Hermitian operator is measured, the result is one of its eigenvalues. The, uh, that the state collapses instantaneously to the corresponding eigenvector. And uh, then, of course, there is a disappointment a little bit later when you discover that essentially all of this is wrong uh, or at least wildly oversimplified uh, from either a conceptual or a, a technical point of view. And one of the first things you might become suspicious about is that this instantaneous collapse rule is manifestly incompatible with relativity, which you learned at roughly speaking the same time. So you might have wondered what to do about that and thought, well, the answer might be to go to a course in quantum field theory. But uh, when you do that, you discover that quantum field theory is not so interested in measurement normally, and uh, the books and the courses don't give you an answer to this question. So if you, on the other hand, go to the literature, uh, you find that there are indeed attempts to extend rules from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, but they have revealed some pitfalls and pathologies. And one of those is this uh, idea of the impossible measurements uh, due to Raphael Sorkin that I'll mention in a moment. You also uh, come to the conclusion that although there is a very nice theory called algebraic quantum field theory founded on the idea of local observables, uh, there is very little discussion of how these local observables are actually measured. So that's no good. And then you also discover that there is a very nice branch of theory uh, called quantum measurement theory that models the measurement chain in quantum mechanics. But that is very rarely discussed for quantum field theory and still less in curved space times. So that's no good either. Um, and you're left wondering what was the answer to this question you might have had almost in the first lecture of quantum mechanics. Um, well, what I'm going to do in this talk is describe to you a way in which we can adapt uh, quantum measurement theory to AQFT, algebraic quantum field theory. And this is going to produce an operational framework, which is covariant and applies just as well in flat and curved space times. And it actually does provide consistent state update rules uh, which can moreover be used for calculation. So that's the, uh, the claim that I am finally going to answer this question uh, that you might have had in the back of your mind ever since you learned quantum mechanics. So here is one of the pathologies. This is the Sorkin impossible measurement scenario. And uh, it results from the idea that we need to perhaps extend the rules of quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. Uh, we're going to consider three observers in space-time, A, B, and C, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, if you like. Uh, Alice's future overlaps with Bob's uh, extension in space-time, and uh, Charlie's past overlaps also with Bob's extension in space-time, but Alice and Charlie are space-like separated, so they should not really know anything about each other. But what Sorkin argued was that if you extend the rules of quantum mechanics in what he took to be the obvious way, uh, that the non-selective measurement by Bob of a typical observer in this region B uh, allows Charlie over here to determine whether Alice actually made her measurement or not. 
And as uh, Sorkin points out, this would apparently be a violation of causality. And as none of us want to give up on causality uh, too easily, uh, the way out is to say that this measurement by Bob should be regarded as an impossible measurement. The problem is, of course, we can't say which measurements are possible and which are not, or at least it's not very easy to do that. I should point out here that um, the space-time extension of Bob's observation is critical here, because if Bob was able to measure at a point, then you wouldn't be able to have this partial overlapping of Alice and Charlie and Bob's observation area, if you like. So this is the, the uh, arrangement that Sorkin considered, and he concluded that it was a priori unclear for quantum field theory which observables can be measured consistently with causality and which cannot. And that uh, now quantum field theory is deprived of a definite measurement theory in consequence. So all you can do, he argued, was a case-by-case -case analysis. And people have done that, and a recent paper is, uh, is given here. Well, um, Reiner, Fesch, and I took a slightly different view. Rather than trying to construct rules for quantum mechanics uh, out of a hat, if you like, we wanted to start from a systematic approach by modeling the measurement process. And this is exactly what is done in quantum measurement theory uh, in quantum mechanics. We just want to implement those ideas in quantum field theory. So the idea is going to be that uh, we have a quantum field theory that will play the role of the system that we want to measure. And it is coupled to another quantum field theory called the probe in a compact uh, space-time region K. And this is to be regarded as a proxy for a complicated experimental setup. I'm just going to think of these two quantum fields as interacting only in this compact space-time region. And then we're going to measure the probe somewhere else after this uh, coupling has occurred. Um, so just as a, a way of indicating how this might be realized in practice or almost in practice, imagine that you have a theory with four fields in it and put in an interaction Lagrangian, uh, which couples the four of them together. And then if we think of psi one and psi two as sort of control fields, and we um, set them up so that they are switched on largely in these green and uh, orange regions here, then the overall effect of the interaction between phi one and phi two will really only be switched on in the crossover region, which is compact. So um, this is a sort of cartoon of how you could arrange two quantum fields to be coupled in a compact space-time region. So uh, the picture is over here. We want to prepare the system and probe. We want to couple them together, and then we will measure the probe. But we want to interpret all of this as a, a sort of hypothetical or fictional uh, setup where we first prepare the system, we make a measurement of the system, without any reference to a probe. And then afterwards, there should be some updated state of the system. So this right-hand column is a sort of fictitious account of what happened. The left-hand uh, column is what actually happens in the real world, where we actually make our measurement. So there is a sort of uh, duality of language here. Uh, we perform the measurements in a coupled theory where the system and probe uh, get coupled together, but we always describe them in the language of this uncoupled system, which is fictitious. So one has to keep in mind that there is uh, a language uh, jump that has to be made to go from one description to another. There is, of course, an apparent circularity in all of this because in order to describe the process of measuring the quantum field, I invoke another quantum field that has to be measured. And you can reasonably ask, well, how do you measure that? And uh, or if you happen to be juvenile, um, you might put it like this, quis metiator ipsos mensores, who measures the measurers? Um, now, I'm not going to get trapped in this circularity because I take the viewpoint that someone somewhere does know how to measure something. So the measurement chain, in a sense, should be pursued from the other end, from the point that somebody has measured something and then work down to the fundamental theory that was measured at the bottom of the chain. 
So my measurement chain, uh, if you like, is only finitely many steps long. I'm not going to get too worried about the measurement problem uh, in, in the large. I'm going to describe all of this using algebraic quantum field theory. Uh, here is a sort of quick start uh, in case uh, people are less familiar. The idea is to describe a quantum field theory on space-time m in terms of a star algebra, A of m. And this will be a star algebra with a unit, so we can form linear combinations, products, adjoints, or star operations, if you like, and there's the unit one. And this algebra has subalgebras, A, M, N, which are labeled by open regions N of the space time. And of course, if we set N equal to M, we should get the whole algebra back. That's the idea. There are some um, terms and conditions. Um, firstly, the typical elements of one of these subalgebras would include smeared fields. So if you have a field, and you integrate it against a test function that vanishes outside region N, then you would expect that phi smeared with F should belong to the uh, algebra associated with region N. Other uh, reasonable conditions to put on would be these, uh, that if one region is nested inside another, then the corresponding algebras are nested one inside the other, which goes with the name of isotony. A very important one is that if the region N happens to contain a Cauchy surface for our whole space time, then the algebra of this, sub of this region N should again be equal to the whole algebra. In other words, everything can be determined from a neighborhood of a Cauchy surface. That's the basic idea. This is called the time slice assumption. There are some other assumptions which I'm not going to go into in uh, any great detail, uh, but uh, these season to taste more or less. You will use these um, assumptions uh, as and when needed. In particular, uh, we interpret sulfur joint elements of these algebras, A, M, N, as observables that are localizable in the region N. Now, a given observable can be localized in many regions, as you can see from the isotony. Of course, if it can be localized in one region, then it can be localized in any larger region too. And the time slice also shows that uh, it can be localized in any neighborhood of any Cauchy surface. So it's not as if every observable goes with a unique localization region, but uh, we can certainly say that a given observable may be localizable in a certain region. And that's the idea of these local algebras. States are regarded as maps that assign expectation values to our observables. So they are uh, linear maps from the algebra to the complex numbers. Uh, and they should be normalized by sending the unit to one and positive in that uh, a, any uh, A star A uh, combination should be mapped to a non-negative uh, real number. So that's the uh, basic uh, outlines of AQFT. It's more or less all you need for this talk. And now we can come to the implementation. Oh, I should mention here that I have not assumed any particular Lagrangian in this description. This is a very general way of describing a large class of quantum field theories. So now the implementation of the measurement scheme is the following. Uh, as I mentioned, the system and the probe are both going to be described by quantum field theories on some space time, which will be assumed to be globally hyperbolic. Um, I'm going to compare two theories. I'm going to compare the uncoupled combination of A and B, where we simply tensor together the local algebras of A and B in order to get the local algebra of this uncoupled combination. That's one thing. And on the other hand, I'm going to consider a coupled combination of these theories where the coupling takes place in region K. And I need to uh, tell you how I define a coupled theory. I make the fewest assumptions possible. I will assume that the coupled theory also has local algebras. I will assume that outside the causal hull of the coupling region, uh, the 
coupled algebras are isomorphic to the uncoupled algebras. But importantly, I'm also assuming that the isomorphisms involved, the system of isomorphisms you get, is uh, compatible with the isotony assumption that I made uh, for any theory. So um, this is the uh, all I'm assuming about what a coupled theory is. Causal hull, by the way, uh, is simply the intersection of the causal future of our coupling region with the causal past. So if K is the sort of um, curvy region in here, its causal hull would actually fill out just a little bit more. Uh, and that's what I mean uh, when I say causal hull. OK, so that's the uh, idea. I'm going to compare these two theories. And I do it like this. Um, I can uh, determine geometrical in and out regions. And uh, the in region is going to be M minus and uh, the out region is M plus. And I get them simply by excising either the future of the coupling region to get the in region or the past of the coupling region to get the out region. Okay, so this is geometrically determined. I don't have to make any choices uh, in order to do that. Now, uh, because these are outside the causal hull of the coupling region, the coupled and uncoupled theories agree on M minus and M plus. And uh, moreover, uh, there are Cauchy surfaces for the whole space time contained in M minus and M plus. And these allow us to build isomorphisms between the algebra for the whole space time in the uncoupled and coupled theories. Let's see how it goes. The first step is to start with the uncoupled theory for the whole space time and use the time slice property to say that this is equal to the uh, algebra for either the in region or the out region. We then use the assumption that outside the causal hull, there are isomorphisms between the uncoupled and coupled theory. And finally, we use the time slice property for the coupled theory to say that, well, this uh, local algebra here is already the whole algebra for the coupled combination. Putting all of that together, we have an isomorphism between the uncoupled and coupled theory. Um, and this will be called the scattering operator for very obvious reasons. Uh, I am going to construct this um, for future reference by starting with the future identification from uncoupled to coupled and then reversing that in the past. So this scattering map, if you like, goes from the future back to the past. It's that convention. So this scattering operator is an automorphism of the uncoupled algebra for M. And it has a nice locality property, which is that if we were to restrict to the local algebra for any region N in the causal complement of the coupling region, then it reduces simply to the identity. So there is no effect of this coupling uh, causally separated from the coupling region, which is as you would like things to be. And that comes for free, given the assumptions that I've made. Now we can describe the measurement scheme itself. Uh, the slogan is prepare early and measure late. And I use these maps Tor plus and Tor minus to translate between the fictitious language of the uncoupled system and the uh, physical coupled system. So here are some examples uh, of fictitious language and how we translate them. So the first uh, is uh, the statement that we prepare the system and probe in states omega and sigma at early times. Well, of course, uh, that relates to the fictitious uncoupled system. In the physical world, what we have is this theory where the two things are coupled together. The translation, therefore, is that we prepare this coupled theory in a state which I'm writing omega tilde sigma. And how is omega tilde defined? Um, we take an observable of the coupled theory that we want to find the de define an expectation for. We use the identification between the 
coupled and uncoupled theory to pull that back at early times to the uncoupled theory. And then we take the expectation of that observable in this tensor product um, between omega and sigma, which is clearly an, un a, a, an uncorrelated state of the system probe uncoupled theory. And in this way, we have defined a state omega tilde sigma of the coupled theory. So that's our first translation. And here we use the identification at early times. The second piece of fictitious language is that we measure an observable of the probe, say B, at late times. We have the same problem. In the physical world, we just have the coupled system. So what we mean is, of course, we take an observable of the uncoupled combination, identity tensor B, which is what we would think of as an observable of the probe, and we use the identification between uncoupled and coupled theories at late times to uh, drag that across to the coupled theory and get a new observable that I will write B tilde. So now I have a state of the coupled theory and an observable of the coupled theory. And that is what will actually be measured. That observable B tilde in this state, omega sub tilde uh, sigma. Now I need to come back. I need to do some detranslation. Um, so I'm going to uh, take the actual measurement of this observable in that state, and I'm going to interpret it as a fictitious measurement of an observable of the system by itself, and I'll call that an induced system observable. And uh, the observable I'm looking for is an observable A, which has the same expectation value uh, in our state omega, the system state, as the expectation value of our actual measurement. So that's what I'm looking for, and it's actually not too hard to write a formula for it. Um, we take our uh, observable B, tensor it with the unit, we apply the scattering map, and then we apply a sort of conditional expectation map, eta sub sigma, that pulls that from the um, uncoupled combination back down to the system theory by itself. All of that together is a map that I will write as epsilon sigma. It maps probe observables to system observables. And then it guarantees that we have the, this matching of expectation values that I mentioned before. And uh, explicitly, the uh, eta sigma, this sort of conditional expectation, is, excuse me, by ah, my, my little bubble again, apologies. Uh, it is the linear extension of the map that sends p tensor q to uh, sigma of q times p. OK. So this is completely explicit. Um, we have a formula for what the uh, induced system observable is. Um, the question is, what can be said about these induced observables? And uh, under fairly mild terms and conditions, more or less the ones I've written down, plus one more, which is uh, called the Haag property, one can prove the following. If we take any local observable B, of the probe, then the induced system observable corresponding to B can be localizable or is localizable in any open, connected, causally convex set containing the coupling region. So it's just a little bit bigger than the coupling region. Any set just a little bit bigger than the coupling region is somewhere that this observable can be localized. So it lives near the coupling between the two theories. A second very natural property is that if we were to take an observable of the probe that was localizable in the causal complement of the coupling region, then the induced system observable is simply a multiple of the unit which is very natural, it's a trivial observable. It doesn't tell you anything about the system theory at all. It just tells you a little bit about, only a little bit, about the way that the probe was prepared. So that's very natural too. You would hope that you couldn't find out anything about the system using an observable in the causal complement of the coupling. Now, um, 
The next point is that although by construction, the expectation values of the induced observable in the system state and the physical measurement match, um, the variances can be computed. And it turns out that the variance of the true observable, true measurement in the physical world, is always greater than or equal to the variance of our induced, induced system observable in the system state. And this is simply a reflection of detector noise. Okay. It's uh, related to the following point that a probe effect uh, induces a system effect that is typically unsharp. Now, um, again, for people who might not have come across the terminology, uh, an effect is simply an observable corresponding to a true false measurement. Uh, the expectation value is the probability that uh, the thing comes out true, and the probability that it comes out false is the expectation of 1 minus b. And uh, b and 1 minus b are therefore required to be positive operators. And we say that this effect is sharp if b is in fact a projection uh, operator. Now, the point is that even if we start with a sharp uh, effect in the probe, a projection, um, what we find for the induced observable is that, well, yes, uh, the induced observable is positive, And in fact, yes, it's an effect. But um, we crucially do not have equality between the uh, induced observable and its square. So in general, this cannot be a projection operator. Uh, though it's it's dominated by this um, by the induced operator, which is by the way uh, self-adjoint. So um, typically, what you end up with is a way of measuring unsharp measure, unsharp observables of the system theory. That's what this system gives, and it's the same story in quantum measurement theory uh, in quantum mechanics. That's why people tend to like POVMs, positive operator valued measures, rather than projection value measures when it comes to, to measurement theory. So I want to give you uh, an example now to see how this can work out in practice. Let's uh, consider a simple system with uh, two free scalar fields. Uh, phi is going to be the system and psi is going to be the probe. And I can couple them together in a local region simply by adding an interaction term to the Lagrangian which is the product of the two fields times, times some um, coupling function rho, which is compactly supported and its support is going to define the coupling region. The equations of motion that come out of this are linear. It's a linear system, um, but this means that we can quantize without any trouble whatsoever and um, come up with a, a good quantum theory. And when we do that, we find that we can, in fact, calculate the uh, scattering map in terms of uh, PDE data, really. So it's easiest to present this in terms of formal power series or vial operators, depending on the formalism, formal, formalism you're using. Uh, let's take some test function H, which is supported up in the out region of the coupling, so somewhere like here and consider a smeared observable, psi smeared against H. This is a probe observable, localizable in this region here. And uh, we can apply the scattering map to it. And what comes out is a tensor product of two exponentiated fields. In this way here, um, we have a, um, an exponentiated smeared field of the system where this smearing function f minus is localized, it's supported down here where the support of rho, the coupling map, meets the causal past of h. Okay. Uh, so that's what's going on this first factor. And in the second factor, we find a smearing of the probe field with another test function, h minus. And uh, h minus is equal to our original function h plus an extra bit, which is supported down in this intersection region between the support of rho 
and uh, the causal past of H. So um, because we have this very nice formula, we can calculate now what the induced observable is corresponding to this exponentiated field. And it comes out very nicely because if you remember, this conditional expectation simply applies a, uh, an expectation value to the second factor and then multiplies through. So the induced observable that we get here is simply a scalar multiple of the induced uh, of this uh, exponentiated field of the system. So if we have, for example, a Gaussian state sigma, uh, then we can evaluate the prefactor very nicely. And uh, this is our final formula. OK, so F minus and H minus have to be obtained by solving PDEs, but in principle, they are determined once one knows uh, what the test function H and coupling function rho actually are. So, uh, of course, now we have these uh, exponentials, we can differentiate to find out what happens to specific uh, fields. And if we do that, uh, we find that the induced observable corresponding to just psi smeared against H is uh, exactly the system field phi smeared against F minus. But when we go to the quadratic order, we see that, well, we get um, the induced observable coming from the square of psi f h is equal to the square uh, of phi f minus plus an additional term. And this is uh, what I mentioned earlier. The variance is larger um, when we uh, go to these um, induced observables. They have larger variance. It's essentially uh, an expression of detector noise. And in this instance, we can see that it comes from the two-point function of the probe preparation state. That was, S was its two-point function. So um, that's a specific example. Uh, and it, as I say here, allows us to see quite explicitly that we have a matching of expectation values, but that the variance of the true measurement is that little bit bigger than the measurement, than, than the variance of the idealized system only. Uh, measurement. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to say on the subject of induced observables. And uh, now I'm going to move on to the question of state updates. So here we come back to the question I started with, how can one adopt the instantaneous collapse rule from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory? Uh, even in, in curved space times. Well, rather than make things up, uh, we take the view that um, there is a reason we uh, have state updates and it should be to facilitate predictions for future observations. So um, we can consider two independent probes coupled to the same system each of which maybe measures an effect, one of these true-false measurements. We'll measure both A and B. And uh, here is a physical question. If A is measured true, what is the probability that B is measured true? It's a conditional uh, probability. That is a physical question to which we wish to know the answer. But there is a subsidiary question in the background which is, can we express this probability, this conditional probability, using an updated state? Okay, so I take that as secondary. Um, I actually, in the first instance, want to get an answer to this question here, um, but it will turn out that there are circumstances where we can um, have an updated state. The advantage of pursuing things in this way is that I'm going to think of these two probes as a single super probe, if you like, combined together. And I can combine the two effects, A and B, as uh, they combine the conjunction uh, effect, which is the success of both of them. And that will be modeled by A tensor B. And now I can say that the conditional probability that answers the question I set out uh, the probability that B is measured true, conditioned on a successful measurement of A, well, by standard 
ordinary um, classical probability, this expectation value is the ratio of the probability that A and B uh, is measured successfully divided by the probability that A is measured successfully, just the standard conditional probability. But uh, everything on the right hand side of this equation can, relates to single probes. In this case, it's the super probe, the combination of the two, but I can think of that as a single device if I wish. And I've already said how to compute expectation values for these um, individual probes. So I can write the formulae using the earlier part of the talk. So the probability that A is measured true can be written out uh, in such a way using the scattering map for A and the probe preparation state for the A probe. And of course, the A observable is sitting in there. And on the, in the numerator, we have the combined A and B effect. Uh, we have the scattering map for the combined probe, and we have the combined preparation state. Uh, so this ratio here is the answer to our question. What is this conditional probability? The probability that B is measured true given that A is measured true. Now, if it should turn out that this expectation value can be written as the expectation value of B in some state A, and of course that this should be true for all B, uh, then we could reasonably say that omega A is an updated state that reflects a successful measurement of A. Okay, that's the, the uh, perspective I'm going to have on what an update rule is about. So now the question turns into, well, under what circumstances can I write this ratio as an expectation value in some state omega A? And clearly that depends a little bit on the relationship between uh, the combined scattering map and the scattering map for A by itself and also the scattering map for B by itself. So let's think about that a little. So these probes, um, let's uh, suppose that they can be separated by a Cauchy surface. And in fact, in general, when we have two regions separated by a Cauchy surface, we will say that they are causally orderable. Now in this picture here, it's pretty clear that K2 comes after K1 because it lies to the future of, of a Cauchy surface. But of course there are situations as with uh, space-like separated regions, where we can drive, draw a Cauchy surface um, between them in either order. Um, this doesn't stop them being orderable, but it does mean that there isn't a unique order. We have to choose one of the compatible orders available to us. Now, uh, similarly, if we have n regions, um, we will say that they are causally orderable. If we can label them k1 up to kn so that uh, each kn lies to the um, past of a Cauchy surface separating it from Kn plus one. And um, any labeling like this, we will call a compatible causal order. And I will write that using this little triangle um, symbol. Okay. Now, uh, a physical assumption I'm going to make now is one called causal factorization, which is that if we have two coupling regions, Ka and Kb, and uh, there is a causal ordering, a compatible causal ordering, so that Ka is to the past of Kb, then it should be that the combined scattering map factorizes into the scattering map for B, which is the later one, comes first, followed by the scattering map for A. Uh, of course, both of those have to be extended from originally scattering maps on just system plus probe B um, or system plus probe A to the full tensor product of, of the three systems, okay, system, probe A and probe B. But we just have to do that by tensoring in uh, factors of an identity at appropriate places. So this uh, is an assumption on the dynamics that we have this causal factorization, but it's a very reasonable one 
It's closely uh, related to the Bogolyubov factorization formula in um, perturbative quantum field theory. And it's something that you can check in models. So I'm not too bothered about uh, putting this in as an extra assumption. It is a very natural one to have. Now, a nice um, immediate consequence of expressing causal factorization like this is that if we have space-like separated regions, Ka and Kb, then uh, we are allowed to have either causal order between A and B, which means that um, the combined scattering map can be factored in either order. Or in other words, the two scattering maps, theta A and theta B, commute with one another. So that's a very useful fact. Now, a theorem, which is not too hard to uh, show, essentially you just have to go through the algebra, is that if causal factorization holds and we have Ka to the past of Kb according to some compatible causal ordering, then the conditional expectation that B is measured true given that A is measured true in state omega, this can be written as an expectation value of B in some state omega A. And omega A can be given explicitly in terms of uh, this ratio here. Uh, notice that it involves the A observable, the effect A. It involves the scattering map for A, for the A probe, and it involves the probe preparation state for the A probe. But it does not involve the uh, B measurement in any way. The B effect is not in there and the uh, probe preparation state for B is not in there, nor is the scattering map for B. So this updated state is determined purely by the A measurement. Okay. And because we are able to write the um, expectation, the conditional expectation in this way, I think we're justified in saying that we have uh, a state update rule that uh, on successful measurement of effect A, we can update the state to uh, omega sub A, which is given in this by this formula here. So that's uh, the state update rule. Um, I've already noted that it doesn't depend, omega A does not depend on the B measurement in any way, but it is worth re-emphasizing that it does depend on the way in which the A effect is measured. It doesn't just depend on the A uh, effect, it depends on the scattering map and the probe preparation state. Okay, so how one measures as well as what one measures. Very importantly, it is not actually necessary to assume that the state changes. Uh, in this presentation of things, the update rule is a bookkeeping measure. Okay, it is essentially accountancy. And it does the bookkeeping needed to compute this conditional expectation value given the additional knowledge from the A measurement. Okay, so um, that is all it is in this, uh, in this view of things. Now it has some properties, this update rule, uh, one of which is something I call unspooky action at a distance. Because um, if you take an effect B that is localizable to the causal complement of A, it turns out that the expectation value in the original and updated states agree if and only if there was no correlation between uh, B and the induced uh, effect uh, from A in our original state. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You can't uh, expect to get rid of pre-existing correlations. Um, so once the uh, effect of a measurement is made, uh, the, um, the updated state can reflect that even at space-like separation. So there is nothing spooky about this. I often illustrate this by thinking of two envelopes, one containing a red postcard and one containing a blue postcard. They're sent to different places at space-like separation, they're opened. And once the card is opened at your location and you find that you have a red card, well, you know with certainty that there's a blue card at the other location, at least assuming that the postal service is, is up to the job. 
So this is the unspooky uh, action at a distance. There is also an important consistency uh, relation, which is that if we have two updates at space-like space separation from one another, then I can update according to the A and then the B measurement, or I can do it according to the B and then the A measurement, and I get the same final updated state. So that's a, an obviously important consistency requirement. And we can keep going if we have uh, a whole bunch of um, causally orderable and, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, excuse me. If we have a whole bunch of causally orderable probes and we have the appropriately extended causal factorization assumption, then the expectation of the n plus first of these um, conditioned on successful measurement of all of the others can be expressed as the expectation of this effect in the successively updated state, one by one by one by one by one, provided that we go in some compatible causal order, and it doesn't matter which compatible causal order we choose if there is more than one. Okay, so everything is working in a very consistent way, and this all comes out of the formalism from the rather minimal assumptions that we put in. There is an important alternative uh, to the selective measurement that I've described, which is uh, non-selective. If we do not select uh, in our ensemble uh, consequent of the results of A, but we nonetheless make the A measurement, uh, the updated state, of course, has to be a convex combination of the state updated for A and updated for not A. Uh, and when you do the algebra, you find that the non-selective updated state uh, can be expressed in this way here. And uh, interestingly, uh, it does not depend on the actual effect A that you're um, supposedly measuring. It only depends on how you measured it, okay, in this non-selective measurement setup. So there's the non-selective uh, definitions and uh, a consequence of this is something I call the principle of blissful ignorance, which is that if you take an observable B that is localizable in the causal complement of the coupling region for probe A, then the updated state, non-selective update state, um, has the same expectation for B as the original one. Okay, this is by contrast to what we had before with selective measurements where there were correlations that would, would show up even perhaps at space-like separation. Okay, so they're not here uh, in um, non-selective. And that's again, not surprising because this is a case where there is no communication of the results of the experiment from one place to another. We can again extend this to multiple non-selective measurements if we have a whole bunch of them. And I'm going to put one in the middle as special. So I have a, bu a bunch of Alice's, Team Alice, if you like. I have Bob by himself, and then I have a large collection of Charlies, Team Charlie. Um, and we have a whole collection of probes, acute causally orderable in this way. If I measure all of the effects of Team Alice and Team Charlie without selection, and I ask what is the expectation value of Bob's effect, uh, it can be given in this way. We have the um, expectation of B in a state which is the non-selectively updated state um, using A1, then A2, then A3, etc., all the way up to AN. So all of the Team Alice ones done in a compatible causal ordering. And notice that none of the Team Charlie um, uh, updates a figure here, which is again all as it should be because B comes before any of the um, Charlie measurements are actually conducted. So the uh, upshot is we use the updated state for non selective measurements that occur in the past of B according to any compatible ordering, and we may ignore for this purpose all of the non selective measurements that are to be made in, towards the future. And again, that is just as well, because we wouldn't want to have to take into account 
everything that is going to happen in order to predict the results of an experiment now. So now we come to the impossible measurement scenario again. So this is the paper with uh, Henning Bostelman and Maximilian Hoop. And um, here is Sorkin's scenario again. We have Alice, Bob and Charlie, and there are these overlaps. Alice is going to choose whether or not to make a, a non-selective measurement. Bob is certainly going to make a non-selective measurement. And the question is, can Charlie determine whether or not Alice performed the experiment? In symbols, uh, what this amounts to is a question. If we look at the expectation value of C in the state that has been updated for both measurements, A and B, non-selectively, is this the same as the expectation where we only update for Bob? And uh, if these two values disagree, then Charlie in principle could determine that Alice had made the measurement. Well, we're going to measure the, we're going to model these measurements using probes separately for Alice and Bob. And detailed investigation of the scattering map um, shows that there are further locality properties on top of what I mentioned right at the beginning, or very much earlier on. And one of these is that in this situation here, the um, scattering map applied to C, tensor identity unit, tensor unit, can be localized in the region N. And N is a region that is on the one hand in the causal complement of A, but on the other hand in the in region for B. Okay, so this is something one can prove. And with that in hand, we can deduce that Charlie cannot find out whether Alice measured. If we do this simply by computing, here is the expectation in the state that's been updated for both. We write it out, we have probe preparation states for both. We have, of course, the combined um, scattering map, which can be factorized, assuming causal factorization. And we see that the first thing we have to compute is theta b acting on c tensor unit tensor unit. Well, we already know that that lives in our region N. And by the earlier locality property that I mentioned, that means that theta A will have no effect. It'll act trivially on this, uh, on this um, operator here. So uh, theta A just drops out. And what we're left with here is this expectation value, at which point, because theta B only couples the system and the uh, B probe, we see that the unit here and the uh, probe preparation state for Alice uh, just drop out as a factor of unity. And striking those out, what's left is the formula for the expectation value of C in the uh, non-selectively updated uh, state according to the measurement B. So these two uh, expectation values agree, and therefore we conclude that there are that um, this measurement B is not an impossible measurement, according to Sorkin's description. So the upshot is that our measurement scheme is completely free of Sorkin pathologies. And the reason is ultimately that we've described the probes and couplings using local physics. That's at the heart of all of this. And uh, so turning that around, if you want to make an impossible measurement, you need to use some impossible apparatus, which somehow manages to get access to non-local physics. But Sorkin's not going to be, um, it's not going to be resolved quite as easily as that because we can put the problem again. We can say which local observables can be measured uh, using local couplings, okay? Maybe there are still many that can't be, and then his problem would, would be back in force. Well, this is the subject of ongoing work uh, with uh, Maximilian and Ian Job, 
and um, the detailed results are to be announced, but um, there is a slight cheat which gives us some hope that we can say that essentially every local observable can be measured using a local coupling. And the, the cheating model goes like this. We consider a system model, a system and a probe field, which are both real Klein-Gordon fields of the same mass. We can put them together and think of them as the theory of a single complex scalar field. And the coupled variant is going to be the, the uh, Klein-Gordon equation for a complex field, but with an external vector potential, a mu. And this a mu is going to be the gradient of chi, so it's a pure gauge external vector potential. And even more, chi is going to vanish identically to the future of some Cauchy surface, and it will take the value pi by two to the past of some other Cauchy surface. So um, because the, uh, um, the vector potential is uh, non-vanishing, only between these Cauchy surfaces, um, we find that the coupled and uncoupled theories agree to the future and past of these Cauchy surfaces. Furthermore, um, it's easy to map between solutions to the uncoupled and coupled theory. Uh, you simply multiply by e to the i chi, as we, of course, know very well. Because of this, we can calculate the scattering map. And if we look at the scattering map applied to a typical smeared probe field, it turns uh, tensor the unit, it turns out to be a typical system smeared field, tensor the unit. Why is this? Well, simply we've taken the complex field and we've multiplied it by i, or maybe minus i. Uh, and that simply rotates from the probe into the system. So this is true for all test functions, f. And as a result of that, we can compute the induced system observable corresponding to a typical probe field. And it turns out to be the system field with the same test function, f. Consequence, every system observable can be measured in this model. Now, that sounds like success. Um, I'm not quite happy with that, um, despite the fact uh, well, I came up with this one and I, I'm the one that's objecting to it as well. So I think I, I'm allowed to do that. Um, and the reason I don't like it is, or completely like it, is that the interaction here is not compactly supported. So it's sort of not quite in the spirit of what Rhino and I set out to do. Um, of course, you could say, well, if the Cauchy surfaces are compact, then this is a compact operate, co a compact coupling. I'm still not totally satisfied. And we're working to get um, more satisfactory results, of course, they are a bit harder to get at. So I now come to the conclusion. I hope I've uh, shown you that uh, we can indeed adapt the framework of quantum measurement theory to algebraic quantum field theory. We get a covariant uh, framework that works in curved and flat, and flat space times um, from minimal assumptions. Okay, so it really covers a very broad class of um, uses of one quantum field to measure another. Whenever you have a probe observable, you have an induced system observable. We know where it lives. It's localizable in the causal hull of the coupling region. And we have derived state update rules from required properties. And we have derived them rather than positing them, and then we discover that all of the consistency requirements that you would like to believe hold actually do, at least if you have um, this um, causal factorization property. And there is this nice principle of blissful ignorance without which we could hardly uh, exist, I feel. There are no impossible measurements, and in a toy model, all local system observables can be measured. And I will end just by advertising Maximilian's uh, recent paper on um, entanglement harvesting in this viewpoint. Um, and so you can jot down the number and look it up afterwards. Um, so with that, I will thank you for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, the floor is open for questions. Uh, so please, you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself. Yeah, Reinhard? So um, when you look at the chain of causally ordered things, uh, I'm not sure how much you emphasize that, but it's true that this is not um, an ordering, right? So it's not it's not a binary operation that gets, just, just gets extended to the chain. No, I'm not saying that there is a unique causal ordering. However, no, actually, so you could you could if you just think of it as a binary relation between regions, then you could have like uh, a closed loop of one following the other by just just taking boosted diamonds around a circle. Uh, the, the the point here, this is why I, I like this very much. First of all, I should I should say that first. And beautiful beautiful stuff, and I think it 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 solves this little conundrum that uh, I'd been thinking about for a while. So so that. K1 comes after K2, or K2 comes after K1 here, right, in the picture. Mm -hmm. um, if, you have a, if you have a relation where you have a chain of such binary relations, it doesn't add up to the overall chain condition. Because you could have that between any two, and you could have that going around in a circle. The point is that you couldn't have Cauchy surfaces that are separated also. Yes. So, so it, this is a very beautiful thing that you under, that you realize that such an apparent causality paradox, which is simply like space-time geometry, nothing deep about it, right? You could just have regions where it's very clear that uh, one is after the other, but you can do this in a circle. And what doesn't work in this in this particular example is that the Cauchy surfaces stay neatly separated. So you cannot have the corresponding layer uh, successive Cauchy sequence uh, surfaces separating that. And that, that is what you need in order to make these operations go. Yeah, that's right. And also the other point is to avoid in any way saying that there is a single causal ordering on these regions. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, and, and I think this is, this is where we, in a sense, depart from what Sorkin did, because he, he wanted to say start by saying, well, start with some uh, ordering and then try to extend it to a, a, um, uh, to a, a linear ordering uh, and then try to prove uh, and, and then consistency. Yeah. And this is too hard really. So it's, be it's better to just say, well, the important point about this separation by Co Cauchy surfaces is the factorization of dynamics. But very nice, very nice. Yeah. I would have another question on the impossible measurement. Mm -hmm. that, that, right. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you you didn't make that distinction very clearly. We went to saying uh, all observables can be measured, but it's really which channels can be realized, like which state transformations can be realized in that scheme, and that is different, right? So, so I think what what struck me about the impossible measurement all the uh, all the I mean, since I heard about it. Is that, I mean, if you have if 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 you separate B into two parts, one is only after A and one is only before mm -hmm. C. Yeah. Then, and you take the algebra generated by that. Then, for, for for example, you would have the swap operation. That would be an element of that algebra. So the local algebras are just very bad. That's a very, that's a misnomer actually. Right, so local algebras in algebraic one of field theory, that's a misnomer because these are not the, uh, the local operations. What you do is you insist on the locality of the coupling. Yes. And thereby you, you, can, you can avoid this thing. And, and this is exactly the description that is needed to, to get the channels that are physical. Um, the, so it's, what is certainly not physical is like a local operation, like a channel with Krauss operators from, from B done in between, right? And then if you allow B to be, uh, if in, in, for that you allow the whole algebra and not a suitable subset, then you, of course, you could just swap parts of B around and, and that, that would clearly do this, right? So this is, it's, it's kind of trivial that you can do that. If you think too naively about local algebras as things that are somehow really localized there, they can do non-local things within B. I, yes, completely agree, but not necessarily by 
causal dynamics. That's no, the... no, that's right. So, so it's 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 absolutely vital that your that your coupling is local. Right? Yes, yes, that that's absolutely it. So this this was the the title of our uh, paper: the impossible measurements require impossible apparatus. So yeah, uh, this this is absolutely vital. beautiful work. Thanks. Thank you for. Uh... It's very interesting comments. Um, are there any more questions or comments from anyone else? So, so I, I will maybe use this opportunity to put in a, a question of my own. Um, so from the practical uh, viewpoint, if, if you want to describe some uh, physical measurement process, how do you understand these test functions? So is there like is there a concrete way to realize them or can how should i imagine these test functions as as part of, of some physical apparatus well i mean you mean like in a smeared field how, how to understand yeah, that operation is there a way to, to specify them a bit more so that well i mean could, there are several ways of doing it um one is simply to say that, for example, you're, again, you're coupling uh, to your field and your, your coupling switches on, your machine takes a little while to warm up and then it takes a little while to warm down and it will only operate in a certain region. And in that sense, you have, um, uh, this naturally leads you to a sort of test function viewpoint, something switching on and switching off. Uh, it's an idealization, of course, because you might, maybe compact support is actually too much for that, but it's a good idealization. Mm -hmm. Another way of thinking about it is that um, uh, you could say it is a, uh, that, that, that you imagine that you don't know quite where and when you're going to make your point-like measurement. So it's a fictitious, mm -hmm. it's, if you like, a probability distribution saying that there's an uncertainty of where a point-like measurement would occur. That would be another way of, of uh, trying to measure, to, to say what it is. Um, maybe a little bit less satisfactory, but at least it gives you a, a picture, a mental picture of how they end, might enter. So, so you wouldn't put any sort of more fundamental meaning to the fact that you cannot like, measure things which are uh, like infinitely close to each other or at a point. Like, is, so, so you just think of it more like mathematical convenience than uh, something more fundamental that, that you cannot really zoom in to a point? Well, um, in the end, you, you can't make points. Yes, like right. I mean, you, you, can, you cannot for uh, various reasons, right? For, for GR reasons. <laughs> oh, well, and also QFT reasons. And QFT reasons, yes. So there are, there, if, you were to, if you were to try to zoom in and say, well, what is the intersection of, of these local algebras as you zoom in on a point? You find that you would typically just get multiples of the unit. Okay, so so in, in that sense, that that's one way of understanding why you must have some space-time extension to the uh, uh, for any measurement. Likewise, for GR reasons, you you cannot measure at a point. Mm. There's too much. Uh, well, GR and and quantum theory combined, yeah. uh, too much energy transfer is needed to do that. So you would form a black hole. Right, right. If you're not careful, yes. Unsociable. Unsociable, yes. <laughs> Very thrown upon. Um, all right. Uh, so, any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, maybe we can uh, thank. Uh, Chris again and stop the recording. <laughs>